Uh, Graham, are you starting? Are you starting up, or is Emma starting first? I'm starting. You're starting. Okay. Yeah, we'll unless you, obviously we'll both. You'll introduce us both at the beginning, won't you? Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm. I think it's. Um, I'm not sure how long the whole thing is. Uh, yeah, it's 28 slides, for example, and I think Emma comes in at 18, you know, halfway through. That's the idea. So okay. Do you want to put up your? Would you like to put up your PowerPoint presentation? Yeah. So she'll go right through the. Um, she'll go to the end. Um, there's Green. Basically, we just switch in the middle. So. <laughs> Sorry. We switch in the middle. I was saying. Yeah. Absolutely. Seamlessly. Seamlessly. Yeah. Obviously. <laughs> it's famous Hopefully. last words. So Emma, we agreed with me that uh, at, at the end of my my set, I'll just do the stop share and you'll come in with yours, won't you? Yeah, and then I'll share mine and then I can yeah, okay, change right. the slides and stuff myself. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I'll start at about two, three minutes after one. Is that okay? To allow people to get in. Yeah, sure. No problem. Hola Kevin, ¿cómo estás? Hola. Oh, hola, ¿cómo estás? Bien? Todo bien, todo bien. Ya vamos a empezar en un par de minutos, empezamos. Perfecto, bárbaro. Bueno, creo que voy a empezar la reunión. Antes de todo, muchas gracias eh, por, por venir a, a, la nueva, a la nueva sesión de 2020 de la HAI. Eh, hoy vamos a tener un, una charla muy interesante por Graham Barker y Emma Pomeroy de la Universidad de Cambridge en el Reino Unido sobre los neandertales, eh, no tan diferentes después de todo, la evidencia de la cueva de Shanida. Como para darles un poco de... de de idea de, de quiénes son lo, los dos participantes. Tenemos a Graham Barker, eh, el profesor emérito Disney de la Universidad de Cambridge, eh, un arqueólogo británico que trabajó por mucho tiempo eh, en el área circunmediterránea, pero que desde de hace unos eh, 20 años atrás, si no más, se dedica a, a ver cómo, cómo los homo sapiens eh, se desarrollaron en el mundo. Eso lo, lo ha llevado a trabajar en, en sitios tan, tan lejos como Borneo, Libia, y ahora está trabajando en la eh, Kurdistán y Iraquí, en la cueva de Shanida, que todos conocemos. 
Eh, su, carrera se, su carrera universitaria fue en la Universidad de Cambridge, pero después de eso fue director de la Escuela Británica en Roma, antes de pasar a ser eh, eh, director de la escuela, del Instituto de Arqueología en la Universidad de Leicester, antes de pasar a Cambridge, a donde terminó su, su carrera universitaria, aunque aún sigue como profesor emérito. Y también tenemos a la biarqueóloga eh, Emma Pomeroy. Eh, Emma Pomeroy estudió también en la Universidad de Cambridge, se doctoró en, en la misma, eh, después estuvo trabajando en la Universidad de John Moores en Liverpool, y, es, ella se espe y ahora eh, hace, desde el 2019 está trabajando de nuevo en la Universidad de Cambridge. Eh, Bio, bioarqueóloga interesada en la biología humana y en la paleoantropología. Eh, la doctora Pomeroy ha mantenido proyectos de investigación en Sudamérica. Trabajó eh, incluso en el noroeste argentino, en el sitio de Borgata con, con Elizabeth de Murray, en Asia del Sur y, y en Europa. Eh, desde el 2016 es, es parte del equipo de excavación de la cueva eh, de Neandertales en, en Shanida. Eh, con Graham Barker y otros en la Kurdistan y aquí. Creo que ahí los voy a dejar. Graham, the, uh, the talk is yours. Thank you very much. What Kevin didn't mention, of course, is that he was an undergraduate at Leicester when I was the head of department. And it's been very <laughs> good to watch his career to see we arrive at the moment here where he's introducing us. Um, I'm going to talk about the, the excavation first in a general way to give you a framework of the of the old work and the new work and then I'll hand over to Emma to talk about the particular um, issues to do with burial and then we'll have we'll, we're, we're available for questions afterwards. Um, Neanderthals, um, one of the most intriguing parts of the human story Uh, and one of the biggest debates today is how similar or different they were to us. Um, we now know they interbred with our species, with modern, what we call modern humans, us. Um, there's genetic evidence that they interbred. Um, and it's said certainly that, um, well, it means that, that most of us have got a small percentage of Neanderthal DNA in us. Um, so let's, if we start now, um, who were they, where were they, when were they? Well, we've known about Neanderthals since this skull, the top of the skull was found in 1856 in the Neander Valley in Germany. And we now know that Neanderthals were living from, as you can see from the map, from the Atlantic right across to the Ural Mountains in Russia. Uh, and they were there from Central Europe down to Southwest Asia, and you can see where Shanidar Cave is. So we're at the edge of their known distribution. Um, the quite when Neanderthals um, began, uh, In, a, um, in, the, in the fossil record is much debated, but broadly we can think of 400,000 years ago to 40,000 years ago. And 40,000 years ago, um, our own species, we think came out of Africa between 150,000 years ago. Uh, and by 40,000 years ago, we had spread right across the known old world and were right down into Australia. Um, and Neanderthals had disappeared by that 40,000, 35,000, which again is one of the biggest debates, of course, is why are there no Neanderthals now and why are all of us Homo sapiens? Neanderthals have had a, a bad press um, for a long time. Um, and they are the, we think of the archetypal phrase of, they, of people being nasty, brutish and short, and that's, has always been the, the, the idea, if you call somebody a Neanderthal, it doesn't normally mean that uh, in our sense today that they are somebody of great refined taste. Um, and, and yet they've lived with that. But over recent decades, we've 
we've come to see Neanderthals as much more similar to us um, and uh, certainly much more complicated in, in their lives. Um, evidence is debated um, and where it is, when it is, how common it was, thinking about this huge time scale and huge geographical range, um, and therefore whether a find a, a applies to Neanderthals across that time and space. But there is evidence that they buried their dead, and that's, and Shanidar Cave really was the key discovery and remains that, and that will be, that's what um, Emma will be talking about. Um, there's also evidence for caring for the sick that you'll be talking about. Um, they, were, they were using symbols. The illustration you see there is a, it looks like um, they may have had, it's evidence for a feathered headdress. Um, there's now extraordinary findings um, of that they were making art, painting rocks, painting caves, um, or certainly in, in um, carving into them um, very early. Um, and the more we know about them, the more we see that their hunting lives were, were, com were, were complex. They weren't simply just chasing animals with spears. It looks like there's evidence of fishing, using nets, um, and you know, co uh, collaborative hunting systems. So the more we know about them, the more complicated they seem, um, which, of course, it raises, therefore, the, the, the question as always, so why didn't they survive? Um, and you can see here two reconstructions uh, of Neanderthals, and, and the, the one on the right um, was at a Paris exhibition. It was a model um, made of a, a Neanderthal woman. Um, and one of my PhD students, when she saw it, said just straight away, goodness me, that looks like my sister. Um, so we've, they've gone through a, the, the debate goes on about how similar, how different they were to us. And at the centerpiece has been Shanidar Cave. And as I said at the beginning, as the ancient DNA shows, that we know there was interbreeding, the most likely time and place it's thought was in that area of Southwest Asia between 100,000 years ago and 50,000 years ago. There's evidence, fossil evidence, that modern humans were in that region and Neanderthals were in that region. So if there was interbreeding, well, there was interbreeding, it seems most likely it was there and then. So now to Shanidar Cave. Um, it's up right at the top of modern Iraq in this semi-independent autonomous state of Iraqi Kurdistan. From the site, quite nearby, we can see the mountains of the borders of Turkey and the mountains of the borders of Iran. And this is to give you an idea of the, the landscape. Um, it looks down, uh, has a, it faces south. It's got a fabulous view down to the greater Zab River. It's in the Zagros Mountains that form the, the boundary coming down here between Iraq and Iran. And you can see there, one view is in the spring, looking from the river up to the, up to the mountains. The cave, the cave is sort of hidden around here. And this is the view from the cave, looking down the greater Zab River is is down here, and you can see here. So in, in winter, there is snow. It's about 1,000 meters up, just below. Um, there is, uh, and in summer, it's incredibly hot and incredibly dry. The reason why the site is world famous in prehistoric archaeology is because of the excavations by the American Ralph Selecki, who was the University of Columbia, uh, between 1951 and 1960. Um, if you possibly can, you should try to look at the book that he wrote. He wrote a lot of articles, but that book appeared in 1970, or in the 19th, early 1970s, Shanidar, The First Flower People. And it's a wonderful book because it's both about what he found, but about the nature of the project. And in many ways, it, it's a wonderful biography of him as well, of his, 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 in, in terms of his work at Shanidar. You can see what the cave was like when he first saw it. Um, it was you know, in a wild part of the country with, with really difficult communications. So the, the whole logistics of the excavation was extraordinarily difficult. Um, he was looking for, he was a prehistorian looking for a, a deep 
sequence of, of, of the human history. And so it looked like a, a likely uh, cave in that instance, facing south, open, you know, a good place to be. And at the time, uh, it was occupied by transhuman shepherds who would come down and be in the cave in the winter months. And then in the summer months, they'd take their sheep and goats up to the high Zagros mountains. Anyway, he recruited a lot of local workmen. And in the cave, he excavated one large trench, which went down about um, 14 meters in the end, really deep trench. And it was fantastically difficult. There are huge rocks and rock falls. So he had to use dynamite to break the rocks up um, and many other, I mean, ex extraordinary difficulties that he had to, to do the excavation. He found a, a remarkable sequence of, uh, of occupation. Um, and this diagram is, is much repeated. Uh, it, it's his simplified version. And you can see he's giving the impression of these, these massive rock falls all the way through. And he divided what he found into these A, B, C, D layers. The bottom layer, he found tools, stone tools that were recognizable from what he knew from what was being found in Europe and from, um, from the, the Southwest Asia, the Near East, of Middle Paleolithic type, given the cultural name Mousterian. And higher than that, he found tools that were of Upper Paleolithic type, and he gave them the name Baradostian, naming them from the local mountains. Now, in Europe, Middle Paleolithic is associated with Neanderthals, Upper Paleolithic with modern humans. In the case of Shanidar, he didn't find any fossil remains for these layers here. Um, so he, he, uh, he assumed, and we still haven't found fossil remains either, he assumed that these layers here are being, that, that the people who are here are modern humans. Uh, then there are later levels up here, right up to the time of the, uh, say, 10, thousand years ago and more recently, right up to the shepherds living there today. And, he has, and whereas the bottom, he, he found, as it shows here, a series of Neanderthal burials or collections of bones. So at least we know here that there definitely were Neanderthals living here using the cave. Now, at the time, radio, he only had radiocarbon dating to date that sequence. And radiocarbon dating went back to about 40,000 years. So he was able to date these upper layers, as it shows here. Ka means thousands of years ago. So he dated these from about 35,000 years ago, this period of, of, of our species there. He thought then there was a, a gap of up to 10,000 years. And lower down, he, earlier than 40,000 years, all he could do was estimate or guess how old that sequence might be because radiocarbon dating couldn't go any earlier and he estimated it might be of the order of 100,000 years ago, and he may not have been uh, all that wrong in that, we shall find. Um, it, the Neanderthal finds are the finds that have made the cave so famous, in addition to the overall sequence. He found a series of these bodies, and some of them, he argued, had been killed in rockfall, these rocks coming down from the roof of the cave, and there is, in fact, an enormous split in the cave roof above the excavations. But some of them, he argued, had been buried, buried with deliberately, with funerary rites, with people thinking about you know, what happens to the body after death and so on. And the most famous one, uh, soil, sediment from around the, 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 uh, the, the bones, was sent to a French palynologist, um, Alette Loigouron, and she found strange clumps of flower pollen in that sediment. And she suggested that it was, it, it, the, the, she proposed very carefully that a possible explanation, only one could be that the, that the body had been buried with flowers. And that's always therefore known as the flower burial that Emma will talk about. But that's why Shanidar has been so well known in these debates about how similar, how different, and in particular, did Neanderthals bury their I was invited in 2011 to go to reinvestigate Shanidar Cave. And we were able to 
Um, it took us some years to set the project up, to get the money and to arrange the, the agreement in principle for the permit. And we started in 2014. We went out in the spring of 2014, but the permit wasn't actually ready. This is me actually signing the permit on about the last day of the field work. So we weren't able to excavate. We were able to make a proper modern plan of the cave, but this is how we found the cave, which was my, as it, when I first saw it in 2011. Selecki intended to go back in 1960, after his 1960 campaign, but he couldn't. And so he never backfilled the trench. People were living in the cave, and so gradually it, it, uh, their rubbish fell in and so on and so forth. So that's how the, the cave looked when, when we went there. We went back in the summer in 2014, and just from beginning to start to excavate, when there was the ISIS threat to large areas of Iraq and, of course, Syria. Um, and that's when we had to withdraw. So we didn't really start in 2014. We we're only there for a week and we just started this work before the university rightfully made us leave. I then went over to America to, to be with and, and to discuss the project with Ralph Selecki and his wife Rose, um, who'd been enormously supportive from the moment when I was first asked in 2011. I, I immediately emailed him and more or less said, you know, have I got permission from you? Never mind the, the, the proper permission. Um, and he was enormously supportive. He died only a couple of years ago um, in his early 100s. Um, and his archive, uh, some of the students in the project, the postdoc researchers, worked on the archive in his house. And since then, the archive has been transferred to the Smithsonian Institute in Washington. And Emma has been one of the people working in detail on that archive, which has, um, is going. And the idea of the project, I think if it works well, is the old work will inform the new and the new work will inform the old. Um, so what we did, we went back to his trench and this is what he called his Eastern extension. And so what we decided to do was to try to uncover that because this is where he found most of the Neanderthal. That is this Eastern extension. And you can see here, marked here is the location of well, he, he gave the Shanidar the Neanderthal's numbers. So this was Shanidar 1, over here was Shanidar 5, and these people down here are working in the area of the flower burial. So you see here, by 2016, we had exposed that same area, and I put these ranging poles here, exactly where these ones are here, to show broadly the location of Shanidar 1, the location of Shanidar 5. And then we continued and, and down. So what we, we've got that eastern extension here, one and five are there. And so we've tried to expose a little of his deep sounding that goes down way beyond. And so here we see again that eastern extension, the area of those two burials over here, and the, east, the, the, the deeper, the, the exposure of a small part of his deep extension. And this is Emma down here. This is the area of the... Um, of the flower burial and our, uh, uh, the key finds that we've been making. Um, and we've gone down a little bit below that. The burials are up here. We've gone down a meter and a half or so below that. And we think, he said, he found what he called a stalagmite layer. And we think we may be down about that level now. So there's another, there's about 10 meters. There's another four meters or so below that, which we'd like to get at. But you can see from here, it's a huge logistical problem to open up a big enough hole safely so that we can go further down. Um, the techniques we've used, um, we've cleaned the sections, his original sections, we've um, recorded them to modern standards, we've taken lots of samples to, for various kinds of analyses to tell us about the climate at the time, the environment at the time, and the dating methods in addition to radiocarbon, there are new methods, including one called OSL dating, which dates ages of sediments. Uh, and this is as well. And this is a method that goes way beyond radiocarbon. So we've got methods now that Ralph Selecki hadn't got. And this is an example of a block of sediment about to be cut out for what's called micromorphology, which therefore is the microscopic study of the sediments, which can give us information about environment, about climate, about human activity.
We've done targeted excavations in parts of the areas, and then all the sediment that doesn't come back to the UK and goes to various laboratories for analysis is washed in, in a flotation system, and all the residues are searched through. The idea is we try to collect everything that's over uh, two millimeters in size. So it's very slow, very painstaking. Now, this diagram here, we're going to see in the next few slides before I hand over to Emma, just to take you through. So it's a schematic of that eastern extension and the, and the, the sides of the trenches either side. Um, and what you can see here is we haven't found any of the archaeology that he found at the very top. What we do have, these, these, mean, these uh, indicate these huge boulders, and we think that about this period, 20 to 12,000 years ago, was the coldest period of the Pleistocene ice ages. This is a, um, a diagram of, of global climate changing through time, 20,000 years ago. And we know the climate hugely fluctuated before it came up to the present day climate 10,000 or so years ago. Um, it hugely fluctuated, but certainly this 20,000 was, was the, the coldest, driest period. And we think probably the cave, was, it was just simply too marginal. So we haven't found any evidence for people up here at that time. Moving down, we're now looking here. What we've found, and this is the period that dates to around 45 to 33,000 years ago. This is this Baradustin archaeology. And what we've found are tiny little layers of ash. This is one of them, that's another one there. There's a whole series of them. Close, that's another one there. And when we've put a micromorphology section through, we can see that there's small halves. That this is one of these sections here. Um, they tend, the, the, the climatic information in the, again and again tells us that people are there in those short episodes. Remember that zigzag of the climate chart when the climate was more or less like today. And it looks like very small hunting parties were coming because the, the fire, these halves really just look like a one-off fire where half a dozen people have sat around, lit a fire, they're in there for the night sheltering, they're perhaps in the cave for a few days, they've been hunting goats around probably as the main animal, and they're there repairing their hunting equipment and so on. So we're in quite um, ephemeral use. And that's through this period, 45,000 to 33,000. And that's what these halves are we're showing here. Further down in this period, 55 to 45,000, this is the period of those upper Neanderthal bodies, bones, burials that, um, that Selecki found, Shanidar 1, Shanidar 5. Um, Shanidar 1, this shows how he removed it. He, he cased it in plaster, in a kind of coffin to get it out for excavation. And so I never thought we'd ever find um, more bones. Um, I, my hope in the beginning of the project was that we could use these modern methods to locate, having located where the burials were, to date them in a way that Selecki couldn't. Anyway, over here, Shanidar 5, we, were, we found, against all expectations, articulated remains, partly articulated remains, of a body that Emma was able to show is clearly part of this Shanidar 5. And then below that, 75,000 to 55,000 years ago, so remember that picture we saw earlier with Emma down excavating here, what we have, this is this, ed, this, is this small part of Selecki's deep section, what we're looking at is here. We have evidence for Neanderthals living in the cave, We've got small halves that, that, again, are very, very like these modern human Baradostian halves, very small ephemeral uh, occupation. We've got, we haven't got large, thick layers suggesting lots of people living in the cave, but we have these halves all the way down, right the way down, and indeed there's, there's indications down here below. And then in the middle of these, just like there, we have these other traces of burials. And this is how we first saw them, having cleaned that section there, we noticed these fragments of bones on the edge, and this is where the excavations have been of these, these lower burials. And the flower burial really was just here, so we're, very, we're within arm's reach of the flower burial. And so, um, and then below that, finally, so we, we've, we, th these are these upper burials of his, 
and we've got this last meter or so that we've excavated, um, the, the burials, the lower burials, we think date to around 75,000 years ago. We've got OSL dates from about 80,000 years ago. These are the OSL dates in the tubes before they're taken out. We're down at about 85,000 years ago here. And so say one, 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 and the climate's already changing. What we're seeing here is the climate is fluctuating between really cold and, and um, phases much more like today. And coming to this, uh, world, this map of climate, we think we're here, this, this beginnings of this, this climate. We know that the, the climate from about 80,000 years ago earlier, there was a long period when the climate was more or less like today. And so it looks like these lower burials are there. But as I said, what the emerging picture all the way through is it's in these little spikes when the climate is more reasonable that people are visiting our cave. So that's the basic sequence that we've got. Now I'll hand over to Emma. Emma? Okay, so thanks very much, Graham, for that overview um, of the site and the work that's been ongoing at Shandar Cave. Um, let's just step back again um, for a moment to that original question about how similar or different Neanderthals were from ourselves. And as Graham mentioned, one of the key areas of debate has been whether or not they buried their dead. But it's important to ask, well, why should we be interested in that? What does evidence for burial dead mean? And actually, is that what we should be talking about? Um, and I think we can argue that rather than talking about burial as such, so putting a body in the ground and covering it in earth, we should really be talking about funerary treatment. So treating the dead body with some kind of symbolic um, treatment, um, because actually if we look at modern humans, not all modern human populations um, bury their dead. There are many ways in which modern human populations deal with the bodies um, of dead members of society. This can vary from um, sky burials, as we can uh, see here from Tibet and North America, through to river burials, and um, perhaps what we're more familiar with, inhumations and um, cremations, though perhaps not in this form. Um, but also we see um, mummification in various places and the reuse even of human remains for decoration. So the way we treat the dead body is very diverse. So let's talk about funerary treatment, but also then why does that matter? Well, because what all of these processes have in common, all of these patterns of behavior have in common is that they have symbolism within them. So the actions and the way that the body's treated has meaning and carries meaning. And that's interesting because it tells us both about the fact that we have that capacity for abstract symbolic thought. So if we can see evidence for symbolic treatment of the dead in past species, that is an indication that they too shared that cognitive capacity. Um, but it also tells us something about how different societies, both today, but also in the past, might have seen the world. Um, perhaps a belief in um, an afterlife, perhaps that they were compassionate to other members of um, the group and their community. And also we can see perhaps evidence for special places and thinking about the landscape in a symbolic way, um, attributing meaning to particular places. So for example, as many human societies do, we have dedicated places such as cemeteries where we take our dead and are dedicated to the dead from our society. So looking at funerary treatment can tell us actually quite a lot about cognitive capacities, but also the way particular societies see the world. So let's come back again then to Shanadar, and in particular the Shanadar for flower burial. So as Graham explained, this was excavated in 1960, and in sediment samples taken from around the body, which you can see in situ here, here's the, the leg, the rib cage, the skull was here, but it's been removed. Um, there was evidence for clusters of pollen, um, which were interpreted by um, Selecki and um, by Arlette Luar-Gorin, 
that was evidence of there being whole flowers put with the body when it was deposited. And there were various species represented, seven in total, some of which you can see here, um, famously including hollyhocks um, and yarrow and bachelor's buttons, some of which have medicinal uses as well, actually. So this was the is a reconstruction of how that process of depositing the body with flowers may have looked. And of course, to us, that's something very familiar. We use flowers in our own funerary rituals. And Ralph Selecki argued that this was good evidence for Neanderthals being very human, very like us in their behavior and the way they saw the world. Now he made these arguments, um, as did Arlette, um, back in the 1960s and 1970s, and they proved to be quite controversial. People were quite critical of the evidence. Um, for example, some suggested that actually maybe the pollen was just modern contamination. Uh, as Graham mentioned, they had um, a number of workmen from the local community helping in the cave. Um, so they could well have brought in pollen on their shoes and on their clothes, going to and from the cave every day. There were also people living in the cave. So there were lots of ways that pollen could have been introduced um, accidentally. Another argument that's been put forward is that actually it's burrowing rodents, like the jerd that we can see here. Um, they're actually known to drag whole flowers into their burrows. And Selecki reported that there were burrows from burrowing animals about the size of the jerd around some of the bones of the Neanderthals. So many people more recently have sort of discarded this idea um, and it's cast a lot of doubt on the evidence that this was a genuine symbolic act of putting flowers in um, with the body when it was deposited. We'll come back to that idea, but another one that I want to bring up here as well is that it's less commonly discussed, but also really important to note that Shandar 4 was actually part of a cluster of individuals. And this is a situation that's really unparalleled elsewhere uh, in the Neanderthal archaeological record. So again, as with Shanadar 1, because um, preservation of the bones was not particularly good, they decided to remove Shanadar 4 in a block of sediment. And you can see it here, um, supported with boards being carried out of the cave. And as they were cutting away this block, they actually noticed there were extra bones falling down around it that didn't belong to Shanadar 4. It was only though when they got to excavate it in Baghdad a few years later and after this block had been physically removed, carried out of the cave and then driven to Baghdad um, partly on the roof of a taxi um, and then it was flipped over for excavation. So obviously after all this the actual relationships between the different individuals in that block couldn't be discerned very well. But what they could say was that there was definitely the adult male, Shandar 4, parts of two probably adult women, Shandar 6 and 8, and also the bones of an infant of about nine months old. All within, what you can see is a relatively small block of sediment, maybe a metre by a metre by half a metre at most. So this suggests that either multiple individuals were buried at the same time, or they were going back to that exact spot in the cave. And it's quite a large cave, but this, they would have to be going back to that very exact spot to deposit multiple bodies. However, of course, because we weren't able to get the evidence of how the bones related to one another at the time, and that information was lost, it was hard to really draw any conclusions about what the explanation is for um, this cluster of remains. However, as Graham's already mentioned, um, in opening up the deep sounding, so here's that eastern extension here, and here is the deep sounding, and this is one of our colleagues, um, Professor Chris Hunt, looking at the remains in the section wall, um, we found more Neanderthal remains. And in this photo here, the area with the remains is highlighted um, with the dashed line and you can see just about I hope these little dark areas those are all parts of bone we've got we could see that there was lines of a rib cage here and also a clenched right hand um, in this area and this was all sort of sticking out of the section that Selecki had left back in 1960. 
we were able to go back to his archive photos. Um, so this is Ralph Selecki here. This is T. Dale Stewart, the physical anthropologist on the team. And this is Shanadar 4 being excavated and that block being cut out, um, but before it was removed. And just behind um, Dale Stewart's hand here, you can see a triangular shaped rock that's quite distinctive. And this, by comparing photos we've been able to show, was this same stone. And this kind of shoot here, this um, void, if you like, we could also see very clearly, um, and it's just out of this modern photo. So what we could say basically was that these remains in the section were right next to that block that had been removed containing Shanadar 4. So here we had an exciting new opportunity to potentially get more insight and use modern methods to try and understand how those individuals related to one another um, and where, how they were deposited, were they buried? Was there any evidence for flowers or plants being put with them? So we excavated down in plan. This took some time. Um, there were huge boulders to be removed and the sections which have been partly exposed since 1960 are quite unstable. And at this point, we're about seven and a half meters below the surface. So it's, it's not an easy working environment to make safe. But when we got down to the level of the bones, um, we found, first of all, um, a very squashed but complete skull. So the whole skull was perhaps one or two centimeters thick. It had been squashed completely flat. But you can see the lower jaw here, the upper jaw here, the eye socket, and then the outline of the skull here. Directly below that, we had the left hand and forearm tightly flexed. So here's the wrist and the hand and the arm. So we reconstructed that probably the individual was lying in a position like this with the hand on top of a very tightly flexed, flexed left wrist. You can see the two shoulders here and here. And here's the start of the rib cage with a lithic actually just sitting right in that curvature of the first um, left rib. Um, we think it's probably intrusive. There's no evidence that there's an injury or anything like that associated um, with that stone. And then below that, a fairly complete rib cage in articulation. Here is where the body was cut off by the removal of that block containing Shanadar 4 and the other individuals in the cluster in 1960. So most likely the other half of this individual is actually in that group of individuals, um, Shanadar 4, 6, 8 and 9. And what we really need to do is go back to those original discoveries and try and work out which bits belong to who. So for now, we've called this uh, individual Shanadar Z. As I mentioned, there are various techniques we were able to apply to try and get some more concrete evidence as to what was done to this person after they died. Was there any evidence for symbolic activity? So Graham mentioned before um, the micromorphology blocks, and um, this is, a, again, an example of one being taken out. And we took one from just here, so spanning across the sediments containing the bones and the sediments directly underneath. Um, this is not a picture of the one we took from here, but it's just to give you an idea that you remove the block of sediment um, intact, you um, impregnate it with resin, and then take thin sections which can be looked at under a microscope like this one. And this is actually one of the sections from here. Just to mention this hole here is where a uh, sample for an OSL date has been um, taken out previously. Coming back to the thin section, there's some really exciting evidence here. So we could see that the sediment around the bones was different from that underneath. And that you see very clearly here. You can see it's different in color and different in composition. So here we've got two ribs. Here we've got the sediment around the bone and this all is the sediment beneath, much lighter in color. We can also see that this area just here where the two um, layers meet is compacted, so squashed together. And that's evidence that actually someone has intentionally dug out the scoop or the depression in which the bones were laid. Now, looking at this carefully as we excavated it, it does look like there was probably a natural sort of channel there that was made by water. But then the Neanderthals deposited this body have gone along and intentionally dug it out further. If you imagine digging a hole, as you sort of press down with whatever you're digging it out with, you squash down the sediment just underneath 
the stuff you're removing. And that's what we can see evidence of here. Significantly as well, in some of these voids, we see mineralized plant material. So this is evidence of ancient plant material and possibly some pollen. Now these analyses are still ongoing, so we don't have any sort of concrete information about what species they were, whether there's definitely pollen there, but it does reopen this question of how the body was treated and ideas about the flower burial. The fact that we have got um, ancient plant material preserved here suggests that pollen, genuine ancient pollen, could well have accompanied the flower burial that was right next to this. Um, and so obviously we've got much more work to do to see whether this plant material was perhaps um, only associated with the bones or if we find it in other places as well, and what that might potentially tell us about how the body was treated uh, in death. Another interesting point to consider is whether there were perhaps markers for where the bodies were. Because I mentioned before, one scenario is that they were coming back to that one exact same spot in a huge cave to bury their dead repeatedly. And I said before that with the, the cluster, four, six, eight, and nine, we couldn't tell whether they were buried together at the same time or whether they were coming back at distinct points in time. In excavating Shanadal Z, we found that actually underneath Shanadal Z, there was a, a thin layer, um, perhaps five, 10 centimeters of sediment, which didn't contain bones, and below that, some more bones that had been disturbed. And equally with Shanadal Z, there were some teeth from another individual that didn't belong. So this strongly suggests that actually they were going back at different points in time to the same spot. And if they were doing that, well, how, were they, how did they know exactly where that spot was? Were there markers? And what we have here on the right of this picture, so here is where the bones were, and they're still in situ here, just to the right, we've got a big vertical slab that's fallen from the fort in the ceiling of the cave. And that fell before these remains were deposited and the flower burial would have been just, just here at the same level as this. So that might have acted as a marker. Also this triangular stone that I mentioned before, actually once we cleaned it up, it wasn't very triangular at all and was two stones, um, but looking at its shape, it's not a very natural shape. And although we have layers of rock fall within the cave, this isn't from one of those layers. You can see part of one of the layers here, but this is in a section of deposits that are basically sediment. So perhaps that is suggesting to us that this might have been placed behind the head of the individual. And you can see Shannon Z's skull in situ there, and here's the stone. And again, this placement of markers is something very familiar to us as, as modern humans and perhaps suggests a meaningful place in the landscape and in the cave where Neanderthals may have been returning. And we can make an argument then that this evidence for burial and careful treatment of the dead indicates some compassion for um, other members of society. And this is an argument that has been made by others um, previously. And there are other aspects of Neanderthal behavior that also suggest this kind of good side of humanity, this caring and um, careful side. And as Graham mentioned, a good example is Shandar One. There are examples from other sites too, but Shandar One um, famously has suffered a very severe head injury. Um, you can just about see that the left orbit here is a different shape to the right. And this reconstruction shows how that um, injury might have healed up. It probably left him blind in that eye and may have contributed to the paralysis that we know he had down his right arm. Um, this is the right humerus here, and here's his left. Um, so the upper arm bone, and you can see that the right is completely withered. So that tells us it wasn't being used. It also had two fractures that had healed, and the size of the bone, um, Eric Trinkhouse, who did this analysis, suggested, indicated this happened when he was a teenager. But he died in his perhaps 30s, 40s. So he survived a long time like this, with also infections, with arthritis. So he probably couldn't have 
survived alone, suggesting that he must have received from care from other members of the group. At the same time, we also see evidence for the less savoury and less pleasant side of modern human behaviour as well. Things like violence and cannibalism. And again, we have evidence from various sites, but a good example is one from um, Shandar, this time Shandar 3, who has evidence of a projectile injury in his ribs. So this is it from above. You can see this clear um, lesion here. The bone has started to grow up around it, as you can see. So he survived for some weeks afterwards, at least. Again, maybe had to be cared for. And it probably did puncture his lung. And experimental evidence has suggested that um, it's from a projectile rather than kind of a stabbing injury. And some have speculated, well, maybe that is an indication this came from an encounter with modern humans, because traditionally we've associated projectiles with modern humans and more kind of thrusting spears with Neanderthals, although that's a pretty controversial point, And there is some evidence that Neanderthals were using projectiles, too. Equally, though, it could have been a hunting accident. So it's hard to make a strong case just from one example, but we do have various examples of injury that may well have been from interpersonal violence. Another area that I just wanted to mention was evidence for cannibalism, which again, we have from a, a range of sites um, associated with Neanderthals, also a range of sites associated with modern humans too, where we see clear evidence or cannibalism, cut marks on the bones, fresh breaks um, when the bone was fairly fresh, indicating that these individuals had been consumed. So along with a whole body of evidence that, that Graham mentioned briefly that we've not been able to go into, evidence for hunting, Extend. Why did Neanderthals go extinct when we with them diseases um, which Neanderthals have never encountered before and were highly susceptible to and things like the current pandemic show us how something like that is possible and how a new disease can spread very quickly. Luckily modern medicine means it's not having such a, a devastating impact on survival as it might. Or perhaps it was just chance and there were other factors happening. Perhaps the Neanderthal populations were already too thinly spread and in decline so they were likely to go extinct anyway. But Shandar Cave has and continues to provide some really important evidence. Um, the evidence that we have for how the earliest modern humans and Neanderthals were using the cave, um, in that they were using it sort of very temporarily, very briefly, for short periods, making temporary um, fires and things like that, suggests that actually they were using the cave in a very similar way and in similar climatic conditions as well. Perhaps the evidence from Shandar Cave might suggest to us that there were indeed special places in the landscape, something that we see in modern human behaviour, and might suggest that that way of conceptualising the world was not so different in Neanderthals from modern humans. We've got evidence for compassion, violence, and also care for the dead, which, although you know, we can debate it and it may be controversial, this suggests some very similar behaviours to modern humans. And we hope as well, um, of course, works ongoing, that some of the remains from Shandar might help us to further understand the genetic and biological variation that we see uh, in Neanderthals and how that contribution to modern humans may have come about. So finally, just uh, lots of people to thank, especially the uh, regional uh, government of Kurdistan and the uh, Director General of Antiquities there, um, but also the whole team. Um, and various other people who've been uh, instrumental in the project. Uh, 
Thank you very much. Bueno, muchas gracias por, por eh, esta charla tan interesante de parte de Graham Barker y de, y de Emma. Eh, lo que yo voy a hacer ahora es hacer un pequeño resumen en castellano de, de la charla. Entonces, eh, al menos que alguien tenga algún comentario antes que empiece, porque escucho como un medio ruido. No, entonces sigo. Eh, la idea, o el, 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 el punto de, de excavar en un sitio como Shanida es eh, porque es uno de los sitios a donde cuando excavó, se excavó en los años 50 y, y en los 60 por Ralph Selecki, se pensó que era eh, uno de los sitios que, que mostraba eh, habilidad cognitiva por parte de los neandertales, una habilidad cognitiva que era eh, muy similar a lo, dos, lo que nosotros asociaríamos con los humanos modernos. Y gran parte de lo que han estado haciendo Graham, Emma y el resto del equipo en Shanita es justamente esto, regresando después de 60 años al mismo sitio a excavar el, el mismo área, la extensión este, como ellos llaman, y, el, y la trinchera profunda de 14 metros, en la, adentro de la cueva de Shanita, justamente para, para intentar con los nuevos métodos arqueológicos, de, de, de ver si, si, se, si podemos probar o ver eh, algo de, de estabilidad cognitiva. Como dijo Graham al principio, los neandertales han tenido muy mala prensa, hoy en día tienen, un poco, tienen mejor prensa, se ha hablado bastante eh, de que tienen eh, habilidad simbólica, de que posiblemente estaban enterrando eh, a, a las personas con, 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 una, con pensamiento por detrás, como que no, no es que estaban tirando los cuerpos, sino que lo estaban enterrando a propósito. Eh, y como he, como he dicho, gran parte del trabajo que, que han hecho ha sido para averiguar esto. Por los problemas que hubieron en Irak y todo lo demás, solo pudieron, empe eh, em solo em pudieron empezar a trabajar eh, en el 2015, con que la excavación ha ido desde el 2015 hasta el, al, hasta el 2019. Y al igual que, que Ralph Solecki, eh, ellos no esperaban, si Ralph Solecki cuando él excavó en, en la cueva nunca se esperó encontrar cuerpos, el nuevo equipo tampoco esperaba encontrar restos de, de neandertales que, que aún estuvieran dentro de la cueva. Esto se, se mostró eh, en, los últimos, en el trabajo de los últimos cinco años que no era así, sino han encontrado restos de por lo menos dos neandertales eh, diferentes. Yendo un poquito por, por la eh, estratigrafía que Graham Barker eh, y su equipo han, han encontrado, eh, ellos tienen una serie de momentos de ocupación entre, justamente el, el, la ulti, el último periodo es entre 20 y 12 mil años eh, AP, a donde la cueva era demasiado fría para ser eh, ocupada, pero justo por debajo de esto tienen, tienen el nivel que Solecki llamó bar, barostaniense, que es entre 4, 4, 45 y 30, 33 mil años eh, AP, a donde tenemos a grupos de homo sapiens humano, eh, modernos, eh, utilizando la cueva de una, de una forma muy escueta, a donde han dejado una pequeña serie de, de o han dejado mue, eh, muestras de pequeños fogones. Entre el 55 y 44 AP tenemos eh, los primeros entierros eh, neandertales, que serían Shanida 1 y Shanida 5. Eh, como dije anteriormente, eh, nunca se pensaron que iban a encontrar... Eh, cuerpos cuando los excavaron en los años 60, pero se, se encontraron a, a este nivel. Por debajo de, de este nivel tenemos eh, entre 75 y 58 AP. Eh, hay clara evidencia de que los neandertales están usando la cueva, pero al mismo tiempo es, es, un, es un uso habitacional de la cueva que en, eh, en, también es bastante escueto, pero lo que sí hay es eh, más entierros y por debajo de esto, más o menos eh, entre 85 y 75 AP, eh, es a donde tenemos los últimos entierros. Y justamente Graham Barker eh, mencionó que el periodo entre 85 y 58 es el periodo donde es más cálido, a donde las, eh, los neandertales pudieron haber estado sobreviviendo en este área eh, bastante bien. Después de ese repaso sobre las excavaciones que hicieron y todo, todos los problemas que tuvieron con ISIS y todo lo demás para poder excavar en, en esta cueva, eh, pasamos a, a Emma Pomeroy, 
eh, y ella también toma el punto este de cómo, cómo de similares o diferentes somos nosotros de los neandertales en el pasado. Y al igual que Graham, ella empieza a mirar eh, la evidencia por, para simbolismo, la creencia en el más allá, eh, y en la, en la compasión y eh, el uso o el pensamiento cognitivo de sitios especia especiales o áreas especiales. Eh, y como les dije, la cueva de Shanida es, es muy importante para, para esta cuestión porque justamente Ratzolecki, especialmente con, con el entierro de, de las flores, a donde supuestamente enterraron a un individuo eh, y le pusieron, eh, eviden o, o se encontró supuestamente evidencia para polen o flores alrededor de, del entierro, eh, nos, lo, lo hizo pensar a, a Solecki y a su equipo en su momento que aquí había evidencia de, de uso cognitivo muy alto por parte de los neandertales. En ese momento era una cosa bastante controversial, pero a, a lo largo de los años hemos, tenemos más y más evidencia que los neandertales eh, tenían uso eh, cognitivo eh, bastante desarrollado. Bueno, eh, la excavación eh, llegó a, a descubrir todas las áreas que, que Ralph Zalecki había abierto y justamente mirando a todo el archivo que Ralph Zalecki había dejado atrás, vieron eh, que cuando sacaron a Shanida 4, que es el entierro este de, de, de las flores, habían, eh, había evidencia de otros tres cuerpos más. Esto solo se dieron cuenta eh, el, el equipo de Rapsolecki cuando se llevaron las muestras, que eran un, como un cajón de, de tierra, cuando se llevaron las muestras eh, a Bagdad a examinarlas. Eh, y efectivamente había Shanida 4 y habían dos eh, mujeres más y un niño de menos de nueve meses. Eh, y una de, las, una de las cuestiones, bueno, una de las cuestiones que estaban intentando de, de resolver era justamente eh, si habían posiblemente otros restos más adentro de, adentro de la cueva. Y la otra cosa importante es si estos restos de estos cuatro individuos se, se eh, metieron en el, se enterraron en el mismo sitio al mismo momento o si fueron enterrados a diferentes momentos. ¿Por qué es importante este, esto? Porque si se, se enterraron a diferentes momentos, significaría que la gente estaba regresando a este mismo sitio para enterrar los individuos. Entonces tenemos eh, la excavación que, que se, se llevó a cabo eh, con Graham Baca y Emma y el equipo, y justamente encontraron lo que ellos llaman Shanida Z, porque aún no saben cómo se vincula con los, los restos de los otros cuatro individuos, o tres individuos que estaban alrededor de Shanida 4, pero encontraron eh, medio cuerpo, un cráneo completamente eh, aplastado, parte de, de la mano izquierda y eh, las costillas. Eh, el otro medio habría sido removido a finales de los años 50 por, por Ralph eh, Solecki. Eh, entonces, una de las cosas que también hicieron fue, fue justamente ver la micromorfología, uno de los métodos nuevos que podían usar hoy en día, eh, que, que, no, que no había acceso en el pasado, y sacaron eh, secciones finas de, alrededor de, de la tumba, y hay por lo menos una, una evidencia eh, eh, tentativa de que, hay, que, que primero que la tumba fue creada, como que se, había un ondilón natural, pero fue excavado fue excavada y apisonada un poco más para recibir el cuerpo, con que hay como un, un, una cosa cognitiva por, por ahí detrás, y que posiblemente eh, habían restos de plantas, justamente en, en, esta, sección, en, esta, en esta sección fina de mor, eh, micromorfología. Entonces, eh, y justamente por encima de este área de los cuerpos parecen una serie de piedras que no son de derrumbe del techo, que también podrían indicar que, que habían marcado este área como para redepositar eh, eh, diferentes cuerpos a diferentes momentos. Eh, después, finalmente, eh, Emma estuvo hablando de las dos partes de los neandertales. Si bien tenemos to toda, la, toda la parte cognitiva, tenemos, por un lado, la, la compasión de los neandertales, especialmente en cómo cuidaron a Shanida 1. Shanida 1 era un individuo que vivió hasta los treinta y pico de años, pero que 
como 15, 15 años antes de su muerte, había recibido un golpe al ojo que posiblemente causó que no pudiera usar su, su brazo izquierdo. Pero de todas formas, esta persona sobrevivió por otros, por lo menos 15 años más, con, estas, con, esta, con esos traumas. Y por el otro lado, hay evidencia de la parte violenta, la parte cognitiva mala, si lo quieres poner, eh, tiene, tenemos el, de, este, de esta cueva Shanida 3, 3 que tiene un, le, le alcanzó un proyectil y la, parece que la persona sobrevivió por un par de semanas antes de, antes de morir. Pero aquí hay evidencia clara de que, de que le pegaron con una flecha. Y también de otras cuevas, no, no de Shanida en sí, pero de la cueva de Goyet, eh, hay evidencia de eh, canibalismo. Entonces, para, para, como para terminar, eh, Emma habla de que eh, tenemos que, que, que ver eh, cómo, cómo podemos explicar la extinción neandertal. Sea esto por que habían diferencias, diferencias eh, agudas entre nosotros y ellos y eso le hizo que tuvieran menos chances de sobrevivir. Fue una, una cuestión del clima, fue una cuestión de enfermedad. Este año en particular podemos ver cómo, cómo la enfermedad puede parar el mundo o fue por causa de suerte o, o por alguna otra cosa así. La evidencia de la cueva de Shanida es eh, que los neandertales usaron la cueva muy similarmente a los, a los uh, humanos modernos. Parece que estaban usando el paisaje y que justamente el, la cueva era uno de estos sitios especiales. Tenemos evidencia de compasión, violencia y cuidado de los muertos eh, y que había gran variación genética y biológica. Y ahí lo, de, y ahí lo dejó Emma y ahora lo que vamos a hacer es eh, recibir preguntas. Eh, con que voy a abrir el chat un momento y ahí paso a, a, a hacer alguna de las preguntas. Uh, Graham, we're going to move over to the questions, if that's okay. Uh, Graham and Emma. So uh, the, f the first question is, um, I'll say it in Spanish first and then in English. Voy a pasar primero, a, voy a pasar ahora las preguntas. Eh, esta es la pregunta de Nora Franco. Eh, y ella pregunta, la razón por, por el fechado más, tardío, más temprano de los neandertales de cuatro, eh, 400 K.A., eh, ¿Es por el sitio de cima de los huesos o eh, están, están incluyendo a otros, a otros sitios en, estas, en estos fechados tan tempranos? ¿Es the, the reason for the initial date of 400,000 for, for a Neanderthal occupation of, of this area because of cima de los huesos o estás incluyendo other, other sites to, to get at this very early date of, uh, of the Neanderthals being around in sort of Asia and Europe? Emma. Um, it, it's a combination of things. So it's um, basically, I mean, we have Cima de los Huesos where we know um, there are some affinities with Neanderthals in the hominin remains, but they're not what we would consider Neanderthals and they predate that very slightly. Um, from the genetic evidence, from morphological evidence, this all suggests that Neanderthals probably sort of diverged and that species originated around 400,000 years ago. However, actually a lot of the fossil evidence we have is substantially later and is within the last kind of 200,000 years. But it is a combination of that fact that we've got sort of a, a predecessor of Neanderthals just around about sort of 450,000 years ago we've got genetic evidence and various other lines of morphological evidence suggesting that they most likely originated around sort of 400,000 years ago. Um, but yeah, the fossil evidence precisely is not, not particularly strong for that particular date. Okay, eh, Emma eh, responde que sí, eh, la cima de los huesos es, es uno de los sitios que están considerando, pero es, hay otra evidencia genética eh, que nos hace pensar que este es el, el fechado más antiguo posiblemente de Neandertales, si bien la evidencia fósil es de dos, eh, 200 K.A. en adelante. Eh, I think that, that sort of respond, I think that summarizes what you said. Um, we are, I'm going to get another question. Um, sí, eh, 
Una persona me pregunta si, si han llegado a niveles de estéril adentro de, de la cueva más, más profunda. Uh, again, I put this question to you is whether you've actually, have you reached sterile in your excavations? Um, no. Um, it must be said that the, 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 the material evidence is very, very sparse. And that's one of the reasons why it's so important to go back to the Selecki finds. We have tiny numbers of artifact, but there were, artif there were artifacts down in that meter and a half that we've, um, where we've just cleaned sections down below those burials that Emma was talking about. So, and Selecki, of course, found evidence for middle Paleolithic occupation in the terms of stone tools and fragments of animal bones and so on, pretty much down to the base of the, of the trench. So there's every reason to think that if we are able to go lower, there will be further evidence for Neanderthal occupation. Um... Graham nos dice que no, no han llegado al estéril, si bien eh, hay muy pocos, eh, se encuentran ya muy pocos artefactos a la profundidad a la cual están excavando. De todas las formas, eh, piensan que si siguen excavando, aún van a encontrar, eh, van a seguir encontrando evidencia para neandertales, pero que todavía no han llegado a, al estéril en ningún lado. Y que una de las cosas importantes es justamente chequear el archivo de, de, de Ralph Selecki, que está en el Smithsonian, y... Eh, y ver exactamente eh, cómo, cómo sube excavando Ralph y hasta dónde estaba llegando Ralph. Eh, tengo una pregunta ahora de Patricio Cohan, eh, que él pregunta si han, si han podido identificar diferentes áreas de actividades eh, y cómo de lejos estaban los, los entierros de estas, est estas áreas de, de fogones. So, there's a question by Patricio Cohan. Um, about whether there have you been able to identify different and separate activity areas and where the burials close or far from these ash lenses and activity areas? The, just saying, coming back to the, the previous question, um, we it, it from what we can see from the Selecki photographs, the sort of sediments that are down in that lower three, four meters below where we've got to are pretty much like those ones that we found below the burials. They're fine sediments that probably relate to this warmer, wetter period um, that we know is globally from 120,000 to say 70,000. So it's perfectly possible that that lower part accumulated quite fast in a, a very different way. Um, so that's the, the first aspect. In terms of the occupation, um, it, There are occupation layers. I mean, in down where the those lower Neanderthal finds are, the skeletal finds, there, there is human occupation evidence there. And we want to conduct further research because, of course, um, I mean, our, our the biggest difficulty is is getting at questions of time. Um, as Emma was talking about, you know, are we are we talking about bodies being brought there, you know, within days, within centuries? Just what is the relationship between these 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 bodies that are very close together down at that? You know, we talked in these general terms of seventy five thousand years ago, but what what does that? And the huge challenge for us is to try to separate those, and in the same way, to try to get any kind of handle on the time relationships, the temporal relationships, um, and the spatial relationships between these lower bodies that Emma has been talking about and the adjacent evidence for, for people. And we hope that methods like the micromorphology can give us some sense about, you know, are, is a body, was a body left open? Did it? Did sediment accumulate quickly over it? Um, but so you know, we we can say at a very general level that around that time, people are using the cave and burying the bodies there. I think we can use that with funerary rites. But it's going to be another really big step that will test every kind of archaeological science 
to be able to say in those very simple terms that it was, you know, within people's lifetimes, people were using the cave and going there to bury the dead. They're adjacent, but what does that mean in sedimentary and time terms 75, you know, 75,000 years ago? So it, is, it remains a huge question. Dice que es justamente es una, es una pregunta muy, eh, muy compleja, que si bien, eh, eh, bueno, que, que básicamente el problema más serio que tienen es, es el de la cronología, si bien saben que estas tumbas eh, que están asociadas a estos fogones y áreas de actividades es más o menos 75.000 eh, AP, eh, no tienen la fineza cronológica para poder determinar en este momento si se estaban usando estas áreas de actividad al mismo tiempo que se estaban enterrando estas personas. Espera que con, todo, con las nuevas metodologías como micromorfología, etcétera, que puedan llegar a una, a, puedan, puedan pulir esto un poco más y llegar a una idea de, de si es que era contemporáneo o si era completamente, se estaba usando en completamente otro momento. I have a, a, another, tengo otra pregunta acá para, sospecho que va a ser para Emma, eh, que es... Eh, entonces, efectivamente, ¿tienes evidencia de que Shanida 4, 6, 8 y 9 fueron eh, enterrados a diferentes momentos? So, basically, it's coming back to a bit that you said uh, in your talk, is whether you have, uh, whether in the end, do you have evidence to suggest that um, Shanida 4, 6, 8 and 9 were being buried at different times, or were they all buried at the same time? What is your sort of finishing hypothesis on that. What does different mean and what does same time mean? <laughs> well, and, and it comes back to what Graham was just saying as well about the chronology. Even if there is a layer of sediment between skeletons, we don't know how quickly that's accumulating because we just don't have the temporal resolution. So is that accumulating in decades? Is it accumulating in, in thousands of years? Um, particularly in relation to the four, six, eight and nine cluster, As I mentioned, part of the problem is that we don't actually know the original relationships of those skeletons because of the way they were excavated. Um, you know, Ralph and his team, they just didn't realize that there were multiple individuals there um, until some of that evidence was lost. So it's very hard to then retrospectively figure that out. Um, from some of the archive material and, and looking really carefully at some of the different publications, because there is some conflicting information in publications that don't say a great deal, but it does look like probably the legs of our Shanadar Z were right under Shanadar 4, because they mention in a couple of places that they could see some bones showing up just underneath Shanadar 4, um, but they weren't sure what they were at first and things like this. Um, But again, how close that is and what that gap in time represents chronologically is a, is a really, it's a tough question. Um, the fact that we've got, with Shanadar Z, I mentioned there was like um, some teeth that don't belong to that individual. Um, and underneath there's some sediment and then there's a few more bits of remains. So a few teeth, a few hand bones, a few ribs. Okay, we can't perhaps say how long that time was, but it does seem like the body, you know, there were bodies that have been there lower down for at least some time so that then they would be disturbed when the subsequent body was put there. But whether that was six months, 6,000 years, we don't know. And that's where the some of the limitations of the dating um, that we can do Uh, sort of come to play. Can I just add uh, there, Kevin? I mean, it, it, the whole general context, it, it has been ex an extraordinary privilege to have, to have found these bones. And it, it, it is a completely unique cluster, you know, ours and, as Emma said, these bodies kind of entwined, whatever that might mean. You know, they could be years apart or, or hundreds and thousands of years apart. Um, but I think one thing we, we need to also emphasize is it is a unique opportunity for archaeologists to try it I and mean, i'm sure we won't solve things but most of the discussion about how neanderthals treated their dead 
have been people trying to reread excavations that are decades old. In some instances, finds in France in about 1900. So, to, so we're in, in a way, I mean, the, the fact that we've got the opportunity to try to address those kind of questions is it that afternoon? Is it six years, 6,000 years? Is it, you know, is it within people's lifetimes and so on? It is an absolute unique opportunity. It's why we do feel that responsibility very heavily, that it, it, it's remarkable that there still is material there and that we have this opportunity in this tiny area in the cave to try to tease out some of those relationships. Eh, bueno, para, para seguir, para eh, traducir lo que, lo que han dicho más o menos, la primera cosa, voy a, voy a ir primero a lo, de, a lo que dijo Graham y después a lo de Emma. Graham dice que en verdad es, esta ha sido una, una oportunidad increíble de poder revisitar justamente este tipo de preguntas, ¿no? de, de cuándo cuerpos eh, han, han sido internados, qué, qué tipo de ritos habían alrededor de, de, del entierro de estos cuerpos. Mucha de la evidencia que usamos hoy en día para el entierro de, de neandertales se, se basa sobre reportes y artículos que escribieron hace por lo menos 50 años atrás, sino artículos que eran del siglo XIX. Entonces, el hecho de que tenemos acá, que tenemos el privilegio de poder reexcavar o excavar partes de entierros de neandertales es increíble y es casi único. Después, Emma, o bueno, anteriormente, Emma había estado diciendo que justamente igual como Graham dijo de, de la datación, es muy difícil decir si la deposición de los cuerpos fue seis meses o seis mil años entre, eh, entre uno y el otro. Una de las cosas que sí puede decir es que, por ejemplo, Shanida 4 tiene dientes que pertenecen a otro cuerpo y, y esto parece que, que, que fueron disturbados cuando se, cuando se metió, cuando enterraron a Shanida 4. Con que algún nivel de, 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 distur de disturbio hubo, pero si esto fue en ese mismo momento o fue miles de años más tarde, es muy, muy difícil de saber. Uh, I go to, to another question. Esta es de Alicia Tapia. Eh, la pregunta de ella es, siendo que los restos no están completos, ¿qué indicadores tomaron para identificar dos individuos femeninos y un niño neandertal, además de Shanita 4? Um, Alicia Tapa wants to know, taking into consideration that the remains are incomplete, do you know what indicators they use to identify uh, the, the other three individuals besides Shanita 4, where two, two women and one uh nine month old or younger than nine months old child oh. yeah um just one clarification on the on the previous answer um the additional teeth from another individual were found with shandar z rather than shandar four um just to clarify um yes so this obviously was a a really difficult job figuring out wh which bones belong to who Um, T. Dell Stewart started the work on the skeletons and then it was um, Eric Trinkhouse who took over that work on those cluster of bones. And basically what they did, um, so Shandar 4, they'd seen in situ, they knew it was fairly complete. Then it was sort of a process of elimination. So there were a few bones from the spine of a nine month old baby. So they could tell that that was a different individual They were much smaller. They were at a different stage of development. And based on the size, they could say roughly how old they were when they died. So that was probably the easier one. The two females were more difficult. Basically, um, Eric, the approach Eric Trinkhouse had to take was that if there were bones that duplicated what he already had for Shandar 4, that has to be another individual. So he called that Shandar 6. And then if there were still more bones that duplicated what he already had for Shandar 4 and Shandar 6, again, it has to be someone else. So that was Shandar 8. Now, the sex estimate for Shandar um, 6 and Shandar 8 was based mainly on size um, because there wasn't really enough of the pelvis and the pelvis is what's really diagnostic um, in humans, but especially in Neanderthals but they were much smaller in build and much more lightly built. 
um, which suggested that they were were females. But obviously, that's um, you know you can't be that certain uh, based on just that evidence. Okay. Eh, básicamente eh, lo, que, lo que hicieron para interpretar que tenían que eran mujeres y un niño, bueno el niño era fácil porque encontraron partes de, de la espina dorsal de un individuo muy chiquitito, entonces sabían que tenía que ser un niño. Sobre los otros dos, eh, lo que Trinkhouse, que fue el que estudió los huesos, eh, inicialmente hizo fue que si él tenía Shanida 4, cualquiera, cualquier parte del cuerpo que se replicaba, ergo tenía que ser otro individuo. Y a, eh, usando eso, pudo identificar Shanida 6 y Shanida 8. Para determinar que eran mujeres, se usó básicamente eh, una estimación de eh, tamaño. Se vio que esos huesos eran menos robustos y que eran de individuos más chicos, y entonces tomaron la, in, in, lo interpretaron como mujeres. Um, I've got uh, another question. Is, uh, do you know of any evidence of anatomically modern human remains with evidence of cannibalism uh, surrounding these Neanderthal sites or contemporary to, uh, to these Neanderthal areas? And I'll say, uh, I'll say the question in Spanish and then get back to you for the answer, that's okay. Um, alguien está, eh, eh, Ignacio Gerola, está preguntando si hay evidencia de alrededor de, de Shanida de restos humanos anatómicamente uh, eh, restos humanos modernos y si estos tienen evidencia de canibalismo y si están eh, si son contemporáneos o si hay uh, contemporaneidad con los neandertales. Off you go. So we do, so with the neandertals we have um, evidence of cannibalism from various sites um, in Belgium, in France, um, in uh, Croatia as well. In modern humans, as far as I'm aware, but I could be wrong, um, we do have evidence that dates to the Upper Paleolithic. So broadly the same period, but it is somewhat younger. So one of the famous examples is from um, Goff's Cave uh, in the UK. Uh, that's dated, I think, to about 15,000 years ago. So that is substantially younger. Um, And I don't know that we have any kind of strictly or much more tightly geographically and tempor temporally contemporaneous examples, but broadly within that kind of period, um, we do have we have some examples. But do you have do you have evidence of um, Homo sapiens sapiens cannibalism occurring at the same time as Neanderthal sort of cannibalism is occurring? Is that harder to I'm not 100% sure that we do. Um, as far as I know, no, but I could be okay. wrong. Yeah. Um, <laughs> hay evidencia de, de Homo sapiens sapiens eh, um, haciendo canibalismo, justamente en Inglaterra, en, en, en la cueva Goth. No hay alrededor de Sanidad y que ella, que ella sepa, no hay evidencia de, de Homo sapiens sapiens y Homo sapiens neandertalensis en el área uh, practicando canibalismo. Um, otra pregunta, another question, um, de, esta de, de Nora Franco. Um, ¿Crees que la, los, la trauma a las caras de los neandertales podría ser eh, por violencia dentro del grupo, eh, como se ha sugerido en otras cuevas? Do you believe that some of the blows in the, in, in the, on Neanderthal faces could be related to violence, intra-violence, intra-group violence, as has been suggested uh, in other cave examples? It, it's very hard to say. So um, you're absolutely right. There are other examples of things like head injuries, and actually there's some from Cima de los Huesos. Um, there's other Neanderthal examples. Uh, and it's possible that some of those come from interpersonal violence. Um, the, in particular with Shandar One, this is something that Eric Trinkhouse, he, he did the, um, the detailed analysis of those, those remains. It's, it can be hard to know where that violence com comes from. So is it within the group? Is it between different groups? Or could it be accidental? Um, And I think with Shanadar One, it could well be accidental. There are ways we can get an indication of that. So we can look at where on the head the, the injuries are, um, because 
if people are kind of fighting face on and people, most people are right-handed, you tend to get them on the left side of the skull, for example, and within particular areas of the skull. That said, when you've got a really small sample, it's hard to be sure whether that is from violence or from an accident. And that could have happened for many reasons. I mean, we know there's lots of rock fall happening in the cave and people have all sorts of accidents when they're you know, going through their daily lives. So it's very hard to say, I think. Dice que eh, básicamente que es muy difícil saber si, si no fue un accidente si, eh, o si fue, eh, si fue violencia intergrupal. De todas las maneras, hay una cierta, eh, por ejemplo, si es por violencia, normalmente tienden a ser eh, heridas en la parte izquierda porque es, la mayoría de las personas eh, son, son diestras. Entonces, es, es, ella sabe que están esas teorías de afuera, pero la, la muestra es muy escueta y es muy difícil de realmente poder decir eh, efectivamente es esto o es lo otro. Eh, bueno, con esto, with this, this is the last question, con, con esto estamos, estamos dando por terminado eh, esta charla. Queríamos eh, agradecer a los participantes, eh, a, los, eh, a los expositores, obviamente, y al Paco Orundo por brindarnos este espacio. I would like to take this, this opportunity to, to thank both of you, Graham and, and Emma. Thank you very much for taking, for taking the time out to, to actually connect from the UK all, all the way down to here. Uh, we would like to, to extend our, our thanks as well to everybody who participated both on Zoom, and I know that there was a big crowd as well on YouTube, and to the Paco Rundo uh, Lecture Hall for allowing us to be able to do this. Thank you very much. I'm sorry that uh, you won't hear the claps, but uh, it was a brilliant talk. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. Yeah, Bye -bye. thank you very much for the, for the invitation and to everyone for coming. It's, um, it was, yeah, it was great, great to have you here. It was great to have you here. Thanks a lot. Thank you.